Hey, Boss Babes Fanatics, we are back at it again with yet another brand new episode of the Boss Babes Lifestyle Sports Podcast. And of course, I'm your host, Brittany Baldi. You guys know that I drop about four brand new awesome podcast episodes a month. So go ahead, please subscribe for free on both iTunes and Spotify. That way you guys can get notifications when brand new episodes are dropped. All right, you guys are going to be so excited because this episode will be an extra fun one. If you are at all a baseball fan and even more importantly, a fan of the Savannah Bananas, this episode is sure to entertain you. Let's welcome in social media influencer, TikTok star, and the Savannah Bananas third baseman, Mr. Jackson Olson. How are you? Thank you for joining me today. Of course. I'm great. How are you? I am up a little bit earlier than I would like to be, but I'm thrilled to have you on here to work it in with your baseball schedule. Let's break the ice. What is the hottest TikTok trend currently right now? The dance. I got to learn about these dances a little bit. Have you tried it out yet on the field? And will it be used this season for the Savannah Bananas? So honestly, and also the one thing too, last year we got on sorority TikTok. So we were doing like all the guys in the middle of the field were doing the sorority, like rush week Bama TikToks. And they were really, really difficult. I'm not sure what we're doing this year, but I know like some of the most like like more viral trends right now are like flowers, music videos by Miley Cyrus. So we actually just did that one in the locker room and got like 3 million views. Um, That's like the hottest one right now. So we try to see like what's the hottest in the moment that we can kind of do for ourselves. So most of the time it's actually not dances. It's a lot of skit type videos or like music videos. And those seem to always do well. And then in the middle of the game, as a lot of people have seen, our pitcher, shortstop, second baseman, center fielder do a choreographed dance. We basically take that, the most viral trend at the moment. So who knows, in two weeks it might be something crazy i don't know but usually it's it's funny because usually it's like what are the teenage girls on tiktok doing like what what dance are they doing because that one is the one that's gonna like blow up and that's the one that bananas are gonna want to take and like make it our own and just be so silly on the field with it i enjoyed the flowers one so i went ahead and watched that i believe it was last night or the day before and if you guys haven't seen it yet go ahead and head to jackson olson's instagram it's very easy to find just simply type in his name in the search bar but what i love about it they're all there's like three or four guys in the video and it starts off with jackson in the locker room i believe like just singing the song as if he's Miley Cyrus. And then they kind of make their own music video to it. Like one of the guys is buying flowers, checking out at the checkout. One of the guys is like laying down on the field, like kind of kicking his legs around. It was very cute, very fun, very playful. And once again, go ahead and check out his social media because it is very entertaining. And before we get into talking about anything banana land related, You guys are going to be heading to 30 plus cities. They will be taking the 2023 season by storm. But I want you guys all to get to know Jackson and his early years. So you were born and raised in Milford, Connecticut. So please go ahead and describe that town. What do you remember most about your early years? Do you have any siblings? Yeah, so I grew up in New Milford. Uh, My dad coached me all the way up until I was about 13. So my family was very involved in my baseball career. I have a brother and sister who both played sports in high school. So that obviously influenced my athletic career a lot. And they're much older than me. My brother's 12 years older. My sister's 10 years older. So huge age gap. Um, but it was cool how like I kind of had four four parents growing up kind of because they were so much older. And yeah, I had a really fun childhood. And now it's cool to be able to like actually be friends with my brother and sister when it never really was like that. They were so much older that I was kind of like, all right, they're like so cool. They're in college. Now they're working jobs while I'm in fifth grade. Like that's not cool. But now it's cool to have that bond. Do you remember any type of funny stories? Again, mentioning that your brother and sister are far more older than you are. Did you kind of be like the little scapegoat when it came to getting somebody in trouble like if there was like a broken window, if you guys were playing kickball or something together, were you like the one that got in trouble because you were the youngest? Any type of funny memories that you can tell our listeners? <laughs> so <laughs> one really funny story. My brother and sister threw a party. I must have been eight. My parents were out of town and my brother and sister threw a party. They had a bunch of people over. 
<laughs> and I remember my parents got home and I was so excited to tell them that, and I always never liked this and I'm not like this, but for some reason I was so excited to tell my parents that my sister and brother had a party in our basement and I can't remember what their reaction was, but that's all I remember. I told them and they got in trouble. And then the other story is, <laughs> this is like the most infamous story of my family. I'm in my car seat in the middle seat. My brother's to my right, sister to the left. Parents are in the front seats. <laughs> and My brother, Alex, like leans his head on my car seat and like starts to fall asleep. And I'm like, GD, I actually said it like GD, Alex, get your D <laughs> head <laughs> off my car seat. And like, it's just the funniest thing when my sister explains it, it's like the funniest thing in the entire world. She's like, yeah, you, we don't know where you got that from. We didn't say that. I don't know where you heard it. Like there was no YouTube around, so you couldn't have heard it there, but I must've, I don't know. My, my dad must've said it one time, like in a baseball game. And I just picked it up. Well, thank you for sharing those funny memories again with you being so open and free spirited on social media. I thought you would be the perfect person to kind of have that personality shine out. And with that being said, any favorite top birthday memories from when you were younger and growing up? I know you're still probably currently in your early 20s, but if you can share with us like a 16th birthday, did you do anything cool to celebrate? 18th birthday, 21st birthday, how did you celebrate? Yeah, so I haven't had a birthday party since I was like 11 or 10. I love just celebrating with my family. I'm like very open on social media, but very closed off in real life. I have a very small circle. And so I've had that since I was like 12 and I've always wanted that. I can't think of any like crazy memories or anything like that. But I know that my a lot of my parties were Yankees themed. So we would have a Yankees cake, Yankees streamers, Yankees everything and it was always baseball cake baseball themed so that's one thing i remember from that i cannot wait to start talking all things baseball related especially the fact that you grew up in connecticut so you're kind of on the border of new york you're near new jersey you're a little bit near boston which is actually where i grew up and i am going to be talking about the cape cod league because i love cape cod i grew up vacationing there fairly often again growing up in massachusetts which is another reason why I wanted to get you on this podcast to kind of see how you enjoyed playing in the Cape. What did you like to do the most out there, whether it was trying out the seafood and such. But before we get into that, again, final question regarding your early years, because I know you are pressed for time. You probably have to go work out and get your baseball going today. Any homemade meals that you fully enjoy when you go back home? your mom, your dad, your siblings, you guys are sitting down at dinner together at the holidays. What is your go-to meal? Because obviously you're on the road a lot come summertime. Yeah, go-to meal is chicken parm and quesadillas. My mom makes them all the time. Um, separate nights, like one night she'll make chicken parm, one night quesadillas, but like she knows those are my top, top two favorite for sure. Sounds delicious. Early years, pre-baseball. What else did you play, if anything, and how else did you keep active? Obviously, you just mentioned you were a big baseball fan. Obviously, you currently still are. Any athletes that you looked up to, both past and present as well? Yeah, so I looked up to Derek Jeter. That was my main my main guy. I was number two my entire life because of him. Tried to be number two with the bananas, but someone already had it. So it was one of our outfielders, Malachi Medjali, at number two. And I'm like, dang, like he's, he's going to wear that forever. And actually, now he his nickname is Flash because he's the, like the fastest – kid ever and so he got rid of number two and he literally has a flash for his number so i'm like i could have gotten number two but anyway yeah Derek jeter he influenced my entire baseball career the reason i wanted to play shortstop and like i said being number two and just work hard and kind of stay stay focused on the goal and not do too much else which is crazy now that i'm actually doing tiktok and putting myself out there in a way that like no baseball players have really done so it's kind of weird that like I looked up to a guy that stayed out of the, tried to stay out of the media as much as possible. And now I'm in the media as much as possible. But then really cool that a couple months ago during the World Series, I got to actually interview Derek Jeter and do a cool brand deal with Capital One and um, like interview my idol, talk to him for an hour, like just absolutely surreal. How was that whole experience like? I did actually see a quick clip of that up on your Instagram. And I thought that was pretty interesting again with you. Being a shortstop, I think you now currently play third base. I don't know if you also play shortstop as well for the Savannah Bananas, but how awesome was that to work alongside for even an hour, 
your childhood idol? Were you a little bit starstruck at all or were you just like cool with it? Yeah, I wasn't starstruck. And the only reason is because I found out through the whole process of working with Major League Baseball and being with the Bananas and, and, and doing this stuff right now, I realized that like if there's someone that's at a very high status and you're talking to them, interviewing them, you have to go to their level for a little bit. Even if you're not, even if you don't feel like you're at their level, you have to like go up to their level and be like, you know what? Derek Jeter is just a baseball player. I'm a baseball player. We're talking baseball. That's it. And so that's what I went into it thinking. And I wasn't nervous and just kind of like, I literally acted like he was my best friend. That was what I, that's what you have to do. And obviously he's not my best friend and he probably doesn't, who knows if he remembers me. I, I, like none of that really matters. It's, it's the part that matters is that we got that content, that it was just a really, really cool experience. He asked me about myself. He was like, what position do you play? I was like, well, I was a shortstop. Now I'm a third baseman. What number are you? Well, I was number two, but now I'm number eight. And it was just funny, like going back and forth. And um, he was giving me a hard time on some stuff. And it's just kind of like he was my older brother. It was it was a really cool moment. Well, Jackson, thank you for sharing that. For my Boss Babes fanatics and the High Point Rockers baseball fans that are tuning into this podcast episode, that is excellent advice. If you are thinking about getting into the broadcast field, I myself interview professional athletes just about every day, whether it's on the podcast or on the field. Um, I've interviewed NBA players, NHL players, you name it. And as Jackson is mentioning, you kind of have to put aside the whole, if you if you feel starstruck, put it away, kind of just get on their level for even just a little bit. And then you can go home and tell your friends and family who you just talked to. But you have to keep professional. You have to keep grounded or else your interview just won't be quality. Like you have to just stay focused and stay on that grind. So Jackson, thank you for sharing that. With me mentioning that, do you have any way that you prepared for that particular interview or any other interviews that you might be doing when it comes to either A, performing with the Savannah Bananas or B, interviewing somebody like a Derek Jeter that has that star quality caliber? Yeah, I feel like preparation is usually everything. It's typically everything like prepare, like that's if you're not preparing, you're preparing to fail. So that's my whole thing. But like sometimes with Derek Jeter, what I did is I came up with three questions and that was it. And whatever else we talked about, that's great. And Capital One had a couple things we had to do together, but I wanted to keep it so simple and so open-ended. So my first question, the, like the big question no one's really asked him is, why were you number two? And then what are your favorite baseball movies? And then what advice would you give to younger kids? So I knew all of those would be stories, except for maybe the movie one, wasn't but he asked me my favorite movies we went back and forth but why are you number two so easy he probably loved answering it because no one really i've never seen anyone ask him that and so preparing to like make it simple a lot of people prepare and they put so much down and they write all this stuff down to prepare for stuff and it's like no 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 leave it open-ended do stuff in the moment for the bananas they prepare everything for us but a lot of it they leave up to us if there's a ground ball to me at third base i can do a trick play whenever i want um, we can do celebrations in the field whenever we want. So like, you don't really have to prepare those things. They kind of just happen in the moment. So it's a fine line between like preparing a lot and then like preparing smartly and simply. 100% can agree with that. To your point, it's kind of have some basic questions lined up and obviously do your research on whoever that person happens to be that you're going to be interviewing, but kind of just learn to be able to go off the cuff. So excellent tips and advice. At what age did you decide that baseball would be your main sport? Again, I don't know if you dabbled in some football, some basketball, anything else that you played when you were younger, if you were into hiking. And then when did you say like, okay, baseball is my thing? I would say as early as I was playing baseball, I knew it was the, the sport I wanted. I played basketball and football in high school, but the only reason was because my friends were playing it. It was fun. And I was pretty good at both other sports. And I'm like, all right, like I'll just keep myself more athletic by doing this now was about to be a really good football player, broke my collarbone, dislocated my kneecap, like basically back to back games. And I was going to be the starting wide receiver for two years I'm on varsity. And just, I just got hurt all the time and I couldn't risk um, coming back hurt for baseball. And yeah, so th those are the two sports that I played and knew baseball was, was the one. Well, I love that you knew at a very early age that that would be your particular sport. I find that a lot of the athletes that I speak with, they tend to have that intuitive notion that whatever that sport happens to be, that that will be the one that they are going to put more effort into practice training and getting that help. And I know that you grew up in Connecticut. We already 
spoke about that as we just have. You were close to Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Again, you guys that are listening know that I also grew up in Massachusetts, which isn't that far from Connecticut, not that far from New Jersey, pretty close to any state up in the New England-ish area. You spent some time playing in the Cape Cod League, which I thought was really awesome. My listeners have heard me talk about vacationing in the Cape. My parents had a beach house um, in Dennisport for about a decade, recently sold it about two years ago. But I used to love going down there just to vacation, go swimming, go to Chatham, all of that good stuff. So let's discuss the Cape Cod League a little bit. What was your experience like there? Did you enjoy your off time while being at the Cape? Yeah, so I was only supposed to be there for like three or four days um, as a temp. Might not even get in the game. I wasn't even promised the first game to play in. I was promised I can go down there, practice with the team. Because the way the Cape Cod League works is there's Team USA and then Cape Cod League and then NECBL and the other leagues in Northwoods. The Team USA trickles down to Cape Cod League. The Cape Cod League players trickle down to NECBL. So like it's kind of all a huge like loop. And so the only reason I was able to go to the Cape Cod League was because the Team USA guys... All the guys that were supposed to play on my team in the Cape made the Team USA team. So they all went from, oh, thinking they were going to be in somewhere in the Cape to being on that team. And a lot of guys from Team USA, they'll try out, and then they won't make it, and then they'll come back to the Cape. But like a lot of the guys made made it, made it, and they played the whole summer with Team USA. We had a, our, a shortstop came back, uh, moved me to third base. So I played third base basically the entire season, which was so cool. Our Entire starting lineup got drafted or signed, except for me. <laughs> but now I'm playing with the Bananas. And it's even more fun. And then we had like, I think like 13 pitchers drafted or signed. We also came in last place. So that's crazy. In my off time, go to the beach, hang out with some of my teammates and kind of keep it low key. We would get to the field so early and leave so late. So there was really no time to do anything else. And I know that you also attended the University of Hartford, correct, in Connecticut? And I know that you just kind of like lightly poked the bear a little bit about the fact that most of your team got signed, I would assume, to some type of a big league affiliate. I read an article somewhere. It said that you at one point actually turned down a deal with the Arizona Diamondbacks. And did you ever get an opportunity to play in the big leagues? I know at one point, which we will be speaking about shortly, you were kind of in limbo, right? Where you're like, oh my God, it's COVID. I'm kind of working these odd end jobs just to make money and pay bills like most young people do, right? And then that's where you started your TikTok career. So we'll talk about all that later on. But since you kind of already poked the beard lightly about people getting picked up, what happened with the whole situation with you kind of deciding, okay, you know what? I'm going to wait. I'm going to see if I get drafted. I think it was like three weeks after the cave started. I was having a really hot start. My first game, I went three for four, three for four with a double, uh, made nice plays in the field. And I'm like, wow. And I there was an article, like the big Cape Cod like league journal wrote an article. And like, I was the picture. I was the first person. Like Olsen goes three for four in, in Cape Cod league debut. And I'm like, I was not even supposed to be here. Like, this doesn't even feel real. Like, is this actually happening right now? And I started playing really good. I was hitting like 280, uh, which is like really, really good in the Cape because the pitchers are nasty. The lights are really bad hard to see. And the Diamondbacks and a, a lot of other scouts were kind of like coming up to me and like asking me questions, but not like interested in, in me. Cause they had, I mean, they had every all American in the USA was playing in the Cape. Every guy from the big time school throwing a hundred miles an hour, like hitting home runs every day. Like those are the guys that are looking at. They were just kind of like asking me questions. And then eventually I got an email. I was at the gym with my teammate, Jared and got an email the Diamondbacks, they basically said, hey, can we go on a phone call? And I'm like, uh, yeah, let's go on a phone call now. So I literally got on the phone right then, right then and there. And they were like, we love how you're playing. Is there a possibility that you would want to sign a contract? And he's like, we don't have much money left. It wouldn't be a huge contract. It would be not that much, but you'd get a chance to play, like talk it over with your parents, coach. So I called my dad, called my coach. Guys, I'm signing. I'm doing this. And they're like, all right, hold on. Like, wait a second. That's... Not much money, first of all. Second of all, at the time, the Diamondbacks had the most minor league teams. So if you don't know why that's bad, that's like, that's so many more guys you're competing against. And the goal is to make it to the big leagues, right? So if there's 20 shortstops, I'm competing against 19 shortstops to make the big, like that's crazy. Instead of like 13 or 14 in other organizations. And then also, hey, Jackson, go back, get your degree, get drafted next year. The next year was the COVID draft. There were, Original MLB draft was 40 rounds, got shortened to five for that year. So there was five rounds. I didn't get picked and I was kind of lost. 
I enjoy the fact that you are able to be vulnerable and open up and discuss that because there might be young college players listening in or even females that are like, okay, well, what do I do when it comes to a decision like this, right? Like if you have dreams of making the big leagues or whatever sport you're currently in and you're kind of pressed up against the wall of, okay, well, what do I do here? Whatever decision I make is kind of like going to game change my life in a certain way and kind of help carve that path. And I think it's awesome that the universe or God or whoever you happen to believe in that higher power, if you believe in anything, kind of guided you in the direction of a right. It's COVID. You're going to struggle a little bit, do these odd end jobs. And then eventually you started kind of working alongside the MLB, doing some social media content. And then you got into TikToking, which we will discuss very soon. I actually wanted to read a fun article that I thought was really cool because one, I got to learn about you. And two, I want to read part of it that way my listeners can get to know you a little bit. So if you guys go ahead, there's a website called connectsavannah.com and there's a whole article. It's called Introductions Meet Jackson Olson. It starts off by saying a quote that is actually up on Jackson's Instagram. It says, don't be afraid to be you is the motto of TikTok star, social media influencer, and Savannah Bananas third baseman, Jackson Olson. Currently, he has over 733,000 followers on TikTok and a good amount on Instagram. He was born and raised in New Milford, Connecticut. During his junior year, he played in the Cape Cod League, which we obviously just spoke about. He was approached by a scout. And then I love how you kind of just went on to talk about, it said, with his baseball dreams seemingly going up in smoke, he began doing odd end jobs for money and saving to continue following his dreams despite the deck sacked against him. And it quoted Jackson by saying, I was delivering groceries for Instacart in New York City. I started in quarantine, but that only lasted about a year. I was literally delivering groceries on a city bike, which I found really interesting through New York City with millions of cars and trains and buses. So then on top of that, Jackson began making TikToks about baseball for fun while he was in college in 2019. Um, He said, and I quote, I was just in my locker room one day. I made a video and it got 100 views. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. 100 views seems like a lot to me. And then he continued to do it. And the likes and views just went up to over 100,000 views. After that, MLB reached out to him. He kind of started becoming a content creator for the MLB, working in different stadiums. And then randomly over the summer, I think the most recent summer, Jackson made a video about the Savannah Bananas, and the next day, Jesse Cole, who's actually the owner of the Savannah Bananas, must have caught wind of it, and then Jackson ended up playing for about a month, month and a half in the 2022 season, and now he's playing the full season in 2023. So I wanted you guys to kind of hear me sum up a little bit of that article because you get to know about Jackson's resilience and how he would not give up. Jackson, based off of that article... Can you kind of go ahead and describe exactly what those emotions were going through everything that I just spoke about? Yeah, there were there were a lot of emotions, obviously. And the one thing that I could have done after college if I wanted to was try to go play pro baseball. Anyone can like any former college guy can figure out a way to go play pro baseball, not affiliated with a team, but like go play pro baseball and try to get picked up by an organization in Major League Baseball. But I realized I was posting on TikTok every day. I was loving it. I was getting brand deals. Like not met. I was at probably, I mean, half the followers I have now. I was probably at like 500, around 500,000. And I was doing well, but I wasn't like at a point where I could make it my full-time job yet. So I went and delivered groceries for Instacart. And people are like, oh, that must have been so boring. That must have sucked. No, it was one of the most fun times in my entire life so far. The one thing you have to realize in life is that like, you're doing something crappy, make it fun. You got to make it fun. Like, like that's what life is all about, having fun with it. So I knew I had to make money. And I'm like, what is the most fun way to make money? Going on a scavenger hunt in a grocery store, making TikToks about my adventures, growing my social media channel by doing something that's boring. That's kind of how my mind has been working these last couple of years. Everything is strategic while having fun. So if you can make your life strategic while having fun, then the sky, the, the sky isn't even the limit. The moon is the limit. And I feel like, I'm on the ground floor right now of what's possible. And it's so cool to know that like, it's all because I just took that chance. And I was like, you know what? Like, I'm not going to get a real job right now. I'm going to deliver groceries. There's something else out there for me. There's something my parents 
told me that as well. They were like, there's something else. Like there's something else. We're like, not sure what it is, but like, there's something else. And it's, it feels like a, a fairy tale right now because the fact that I get to combine all of my loves, baseball side of it, the TikTok side of it, the greatest showman side of it, everything lined up way too perfectly. And I'm so thankful every day. And it makes me work so incredibly hard every single day to keep this because like, it's a blessing to be able to do it. And I never want to lose it. And I honestly never want to stop doing this. And it's just crazy that like when, when you put your mind to something actually, and the reason I'm on this bananas team is like you said, I, I posted a TikTok. I'm like, what's the best way to get on a TikToking baseball team? Hmm. Make a TikTok, like make, make a video, make content, get someone's attention. That's all it's about. Jesse Cole talks about it all the time. The owner, get people's attention. It's, he got it from PT Barnum, Walt Disney, the two greatest visionaries of all time. And honestly, Jesse Cole could be that third, third guy. Like I'm not kidding he could be that third guy behind those two in 10 years i cannot wait to start talking about the savannah bananas but before we even step into that because that's going to be probably the whole last half of this episode because i'm very intrigued about it as well i know we see the tiktoks and i believe espn plus did a documentary on the whole team recently that i believe it dropped over the summer along with uh the derek jeter one which i fully enjoyed i watched it with my husband i Love the fact that your parents were kind of behind you, right? Like, I feel like there's some parents out there that my parents as well, I kind of already always had this creative path of making my own content, following my own dreams, lived in LA, had my reality TV background, did all these odd end, cool, interesting things that most people in their late 20s, or early 30s only would possibly dream of. And I always had my parents being like, Britt, you got to use your college degree. Like, what's going on here? So I love that your parents, Jackson, were behind you and they kind of intuitively knew that you would be doing something fun and using all of your skills. What were your parents' mindsets? Like, I, do they have any entrepreneurship backgrounds? Like, what exactly do your parents do? I'm kind of curious because how did they like hone that into your mindset? Yeah, so my dad uh, worked for Rawlings Sporting Goods for 40 years, a lifetime Rawlings guy, baseball gloves, baseball bats, everything in between there. He's also a baseball coach. And my mom worked in special ed for a number of years, and now she's the d- director of special ed for my entire school district at home. So to say that I got like the creative juices were from them, that's not what it is, but like the family aspect. I make a lot of family content, and a lot of the reason why people follow me and like when I see huge spikes is after I post a coming of age video that's a minute long about my family, about my parents and how they helped me and how they are such strong people. And I was a weak person growing up and they kind of helped lift me up. And I owe like a lot of what I'm doing to them right now. They do give me creativity now. It's funny because like they'll be in my videos and they'll like say, oh, I love this video. I love this one. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like they love that. Why do they love that one? And before I post a video, whenever I post a video on any social media, I think, what would my mom and dad say about this? And it's crazy, but like that has helped me grow to almost a million followers now. That mindset of like, what would my mom and dad think? It's yeah, I owe owe a lot to them. Well, Jackson, thank you so much for sharing that. I feel like that was very beautiful to talk about that because again, I have a wide variety of listeners on here, both baseball fans, people that are just active, people that have followed me up and coming in my career. And I think to kind of hear how if you are a young parent or you are a grandparent listening, or even if you are in college or whatever the case may be, kind of like help be a mentor or inspirational to that new up and coming generation like Jackson is talking about. He wouldn't probably be where he's at if he didn't have somebody behind his wings, like guiding him a little bit. Right. So definitely take his advice. And uh, if you are around the next generation of the youth, sit down, talk to them, ask them what they want to be when they grow up and kind of help guide them a little bit in whatever that direction may be. You guys are now listening to Jackson Olson. He is young. He is an entrepreneur. He is a creative individual. TikTok star, social media influencer, and above all, athlete. We are going to be talking all things Savannah Bananas. I myself am so interested in learning about them. Before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about creating content for the MLB. I know that you traveled to a number of stadiums. Did you have any stadium in particular that you enjoyed working alongside? Any athletes that you got to encounter while doing that? And what types of content were you making for uh, these MLB affiliate teams? Favorite stadium was Oracle, Oracle Park in San Francisco. 
it was just really cool. It's the food there. They had crab sandwiches. They had seafood. They had ev like literally everything. And also the pizza was really good, which is crazy because you wouldn't think New York, Connecticut is the pizza. No, like San Francisco has got some good stuff. I would make a lot of skits. I would make a lot of intertwine my story. I tell my story on TikTok, social media all the time. I feel like I want people to know where I came from, why I'm at this point right now. Um, so I would add Major League Baseball content into like, all right, like this is what I did. And I, like, for example, I made a video where I, me two years ago applying for marketing jobs. And I was like, write, like fake writing down stuff. And then it's like today, the marketing job. And it's me sliding down the slide at the Milwaukee Brewer Stadium, throwing out the first pitch at three stadiums, like doing all this fun stuff. And it's crazy how I got to have a marketing job that is probably the coolest marketing job that I could ever dream of having. Going to Major League Baseball stadiums and like showing off the coolest parts and bringing people along for a day in my life at a stadium. And that's a lot of the um, content that I would do too. Um, after the MLB creator class, I got an opportunity to travel to all 30 stadiums. I only made it to 20. I go to 30 stadiums, rank them, eat the food, make a video about my experience and rank them on a scale of like one to 30. I can see that going in a direction where after the bananas possibly like have a show, like uh, not a third, like, 30 stadiums in 30 days or something like that, um, where I try all the food and I find my like number one stadium. Uh, that's kind of the dream after, after bananas. And you kind of just segued perfectly into it. Thank you for sharing everything that you've done, both in your early years and what you're up to currently. Again, you are a fantastic guest on here. I love having all of my special guests on here, right? Everybody has some type of a story. You guys know that I have a lot of professional athletes. I have their significant others because it's nice to hear their side of the story as well. And on top of that, I have a lot of reality TV competitors that come on here and everybody has a specific and different journey and how they got to where they're at. So yours is one of the most unique, having played baseball, having that independent, awesome family that kind of like pushed you along the way. COVID kind of like throwing you into this mess of, okay, what do I do? And now here you are. So you are currently playing for the Savannah Bananas, and I don't know that much about the team. I haven't been to a game yet, but I am so freaking intrigued, and the reason why I haven't been to a game yet is because, A, you guys know that my husband is a professional baseball pitcher himself, and you guys also know that I am the on-field host for the High Point Rockers, which is an independent league partnered with the MLB, so my summers are pretty busy. But when we get a free day or whenever we both retire, we will be 100% going to a Savannah Bananas game. So the Savannah Bananas, they are an exhibition baseball team based out of Savannah, Georgia. The team was founded in 2016, and the team has basically sold out every freaking home game from what I read online and every away game that they have done on their Banana World Tour. And as I mentioned, I myself haven't been to a game. I cannot wait to go. It's on my bucket list. So based off of the fun content that I've seen posted online, and as I mentioned earlier in this episode, I believe they have a documentary type of docuseries out on ESPN, Hulu, I believe Paramount Plus. Um, go ahead and Google it. You guys can watch it. But it looks like their games are a little bit of baseball meets the circus. They have fun dancing, guys walking on stilts, bats are on fire, interesting costumes and content. So Jackson, with what I just described, nobody knows this better than an actual banana player. What exactly is the Savannah Bananas and what is that experience like? Yeah, so the first thing, also, if you want to come to a game, make sure you get on the wait list um, because you can't. The crazy thing that some people will find out when they want to go to a game is like, Oh, I'll just go to a game. I'll get a ticket. Our wait list is a half million right now. So for to go to one game, our wait like like five hundred thousand people just to go to one game, and it's gonna after the tour, it's gonna be above a million. Um, so make sure you get on the wait list. <laughs> but the bananas, like you, ex like the way you explained it, is what most people understand. Um, the one thing that I also want to say about it is it's a it's a real baseball game. We have legit former pro pro guys, college guys. Uh, playing in this on the bananas and party animals. A lot of people think like, oh, they're just like a circus act. It's like fun, baseball, whatever. Like, no, like we have guys that throw 95 miles an hour. Like we have guys that hit 20 home runs a year. Like it's, it is the most competitive baseball that I've played. The reason for that is because we're adding in like doing a dance before and at bat. But then right when you finish that dance, you have to get in the mindset of, okay, I want to get a hit right now. Like I need to get a hit right now. I can't let down my team and the fans. And like, I want to, 
make a cool highlight. The main thing that like I love getting across to people is that they say, oh, you guys are the Globetrotters. Nope. We are not like, that's, that's awesome. Like, that's so cool that we get related to the Globetrotters there. They change the basketball forever, but this game is not scripted. The entertainment part is scripted, but the gameplay itself, people think like, oh, like a pitcher probably throws a strike when they want to have a hitter hit a home run. Like, no, we're, it's, it's a legit baseball game. It's, it's so much fun. We're getting all the fans involved all the time, but at the end of the day, we are playing to win a little bit. <laughs> like, like both teams want to win. We're still baseball players at heart. Um, and the one thing I always say is like our second baseman, Dalton Malden, he's a great singer and he didn't even, he was a college baseball player, but he started a music career, then got back into baseball. I'm a social media influencer as as you would like kind of explain it. But when we get on that field, we are baseball players and entertainers, and that's what we are. And it's, it's cool to be able to come in when I came in and be accepted by the team. And now I'm playing third base and the shortstop. I live with the shortstop, Ryan Cox. Second baseman and first baseman are just amazing people. Everyone in the entire organization is so cool. And um, we're all on the same kind of path right now. We, we all have the same vision of like what this could be. And um, surrounding yourself with those good people is the only way that this thing is going to like explode, explode. But yeah, it's the company that Jesse Cole runs is called Fans First Entertainment. Um, he actually just turned down a $1 million deal for a secondhand ticket um, company to buy tickets and resell them. Because we sell our ticket for $25. That's that's the gold. It's fan first, fans first through and through. So he turned it down. He's like, no, we're selling our tickets for $25. Like if people want to buy them and sell them on, buy the $25 ticket and sell them again, like we, there's not much they can do right now. They're working on it, but there's not much they can do right now. And everything we do is how will the fans react to this? And that's kind of how we've been able to have that wait list. People want to come. If a fan catches a foul ball, it's an out. So like people bring their gloves. It's crazy. I love the fact that you mentioned that it's not really like the Harlem Globetrotters because I was actually going to ask you that. Is it kind of like a scripted game where you guys kind of know what's going on? Or is it more, as you mentioned, live baseball play, but you're kind of having fun in between? And I love the fact that you get the fans involved in the sense of it's not just people doing in between games or throwing out T-shirts, which is what a lot of MLB affiliates, college teams do, but you guys actually actively get the fans involved because I was kind of curious about this. If there's a fan sitting on the home side or a fan sitting on the wayside, who does this out count towards? So whoever hits the ball, if whoever hits the ball in the game, if the fan catches it, it's an out. Okay. So no matter what, it's just like an out. It's kind of like playing dodgeball. If you catch the ball, the person that threw it is out. But yeah, but the whole point is like when, a, when the bananas are hitting, we don't want, like if you're a banana fan, you're not going to, like you probably will just because it's in the moment, but like you don't want to catch the ball because that's an out for the bananas. But like when the party animals or another team that we're playing, another pro team is hitting, like you want to catch that ball. Well, thank you for clarifying that. What is the tryout process like? I know you kind of caught wind of the attention of Jesse Cole, who's obviously the owner, creator, founder of the Savannah Bananas, but- is there like an annual tryout? Are people just scouted based off of their social media? Obviously, as you mentioned, everybody on this team isn't just a, a TikTok person. They are TikTok, social media, but a combination of, of course, you have to be a, some type of a an athlete to be on this team. So what is that tryout process like if there is one? The tryout process, we have a tryout every, um, there's a tryout every year. Um, I actually didn't, like you said, I, I didn't try out for the team. Um, but there is a tryout every year and guys are encouraged to like, like, this is not a regular tryout. Like you're going to dance. You're going to put yourself out there. Like, what is your thing? Like, do you have a thing that you can show these coaches and Jesse, like Jesse is the, like I said, a visionary, like he's picturing someone right now, like that he's seeing in the tryout. Like, will this translate into a game? What he's doing right now? Like, will the guy walking on stilts, like Dakota Albert, like when he tried out, like Jesse saw him on stilts and probably was like, uh, yep, you are going to be a huge part of this whole thing. And like, he can see that. So it's kind of whatever he is seeing, like br bring your all, like bring your A game. You don't have to have, you could have zero followers on social media. It doesn't, that does not matter one second. Like, yeah, like the bananas can help you lift up your own, but that's not, it really doesn't matter. What matters is if you can bring something to the show that's unique 
and going to make fans go crazy. Like, oh my gosh, there's Ziggy who balances everything on his face. He can balance a chair on his face. Like that's what people are looking for. The dancing umpire, Vincent Chapman, like people are looking for that kind of stuff. So it's bring, bring a unique talent or a unique thing that you're about. Who is your character? Like make a character and then you have a good chance of making the team. And which teammates are the funniest? Obviously, everybody has their own character and sense of self because how could you perform in front of, I would assume, a couple thousand fans or there could be more. Again, I haven't attended a game myself, but I guess Jackson can clarify how many fans go. I mean, even if there's four, five, six, seven thousand people, that's a lot of people to be doing a cute little dance in front of. And then, as Jackson mentioned, getting into the mindset of, okay, now I need to try to get a hit. Or if those balls hit to me, I have to try to make this flip this double play because um, you obviously have to be athletic and, and having fun and entertaining the crowd. Which teammates are the funniest and who do you spend the most time with? Funniest? I don't know. It's it, everyone has their own, their own thing that can make you laugh. But I would say like the teammates I hang out with the most shortstop Ryan Cox, who I live with, Oh, I mean, like really everyone, like we hang out with everyone. For example, last night we literally ended practice and then we had a team bonding event at a line dancing bar. Like it, no other team in the entire world is doing that. You can, you cannot give me another team where the coaches say, all right, guys, we're going to go to a bar and have fun. <laughs> like that doesn't happen. And that's why we're so much different and why teams should take stuff out of Jesse Cole's playbook. The team is so together all the time. Like I could hang out with anyone on the party animals on the bananas like the our head coach is one of my best friends adam byron like he's one of my best friends literally like not not just saying oh he's like like my coach is my friend like no literally and it's just really cool to be able to know that like every guy has your back and like when you get here you see that it's not jackson olsen it's not dalton malden it's not ryan cox it's the savannah bananas and like that's the coolest part of the whole thing and everyone sees that and that kind of segues into what I wanted to ask you next. It's kind of like collectively a team, right? And you guys are working together to not only, again, showcase your athletic skills, but again, to entertain that crowd. What have you enjoyed the most about being a Savannah Banana? And again, I kind of already mentioned it. You were with them very briefly in the season of 2022, but I think you're projected to be with them this whole season, if I remember correctly. So I guess two-parter question. What did you love most about being a Savannah Banana last season? And what do you hope for this upcoming season? So last season, it was really crazy because I actually went into the first game. It was broadcast on ESPN2. I hadn't played a baseball game in a year. And um, I, I love telling the story because it's it's it explains the bananas so, so perfectly. I hadn't played in a game and pitcher was thrown hard and I was doing a dance or something. I can't even remember. It was such a crazy blackout moment. And I'm like... Like I'm playing right now in front of a sold out crowd at Grayson Stadium, like on ESPN2, I'm so nervous. And all I heard was cheering behind me, my teammates hiking me up and I hit a double. And I'm like, you know what? Like this, this place is a movie. This is not real life. Like it didn't, at that moment, it did not feel like real life. It felt like I was in uh, playing a part in a movie that I wasn't actually like the one hitting that double and getting the second base and doing two claps. Like it didn't feel real. And that's what this whole experience is. Like when you step on that field and one of the coolest moments is we're in the tunnel waiting for our pregame to start and shipping up to Boston starts playing. And we're like in the locker room, like slamming the locker room. And then we run out and do this cool weave that we always do to start off a game and to hear the fans just go wild. And I have only played at Grayson Stadium. Guys are saying like when we go on the road, like the fans are even crazier and there's more of them. There's triple the fans at some places. And I'm like, this is going to be nuts. Like it's going to be crazy. And we only have two weeks till the first, first game in West Palm. So it's exciting. Very exciting. And I love how you were able to pull that from your memory, even though you said you kind of had like a blackout moment of excitement being on the field, not having played in a while and having everybody just like roaring and cheering. Can't wait to hear about what happens this upcoming season. I know you're going to be very busy, but maybe we can get you back on this podcast again come the fall so you can kind of recap how your full season went with the Savannah Bananas. I love the fact that you guys kind of wear these fun, cute costumes. I want to learn a little bit about these costumes that you guys choose because I see some of the guys actually take their jerseys and like cut off the sleeves and stuff like that. So do you guys kind of have just like free reign on how you get to dice and cut up your uniform or how does that work? 
Yeah, so my main thing is actually not cowboy hat. It's a greatest showman costume. Um, it's what I wear. I mean, like that's like, like my staple. It's crazy. I, there were kids that dressed up as me for Halloween this year. Like five parents that sent me ki their kids wearing a bananas uniform with a greatest showman costume over it. Um, and that's a huge, huge part of my character. That's, I mean, I'm getting custom cleats with the greatest showman silhouette. My glove, my baseball glove has a greatest showman thing right in the middle. And that's literally like not just a huge part of my character, but a huge part of my life. And it's might sound crazy. Oh, it's just a movie, but it's not just a movie. Like it's, it, it teaches you so many life lessons. And if it was not for that movie, I can guarantee you 1 million percent, I would not be on the bananas. If that movie had never come out, I would not be playing for the Savannah bananas because that changed my life where I'm like, wow, don't be afraid to be you. That's where I got that quote from. That's been in my bio forever since that movie came out. And it shows you that like, wow, like this guy, PT Barnum, like he started from nothing but he had an idea and a vision. He wasn't even sure what his vision like totally was yet, but it was to make people happy and entertain people. And the noblest art is making others happy. And that's his big quote. And the other one I got is like, no one ever made a difference by being like everyone else. And so that was it. That was the clicker where I'm like, oh my gosh, like I need to start something new. I started social media. I started TikTok. I started saying like, who cares if people are going to make fun of me? Everyone was making fun of me. I didn't care. I just kept going. Um, and that's kind of my character on the field is like, be yourself, be the greatest showman. Anyone can be the greatest showman. And that's, that's what it's all about. So a lot of the costumes are like, who are you as a person? What's your thing? Our pitcher actually wears a cowboy hat. Um, he's going to wear it every single show this year. Like every time he pitches wearing that cowboy hat, other guys have like our center fielder doc. Um, he has a doctor's coat and he wears it. He's going to wear the doctor's coat this year and do like fun stuff. Like if our umpire calls a strike and he thinks it's a ball, he's going to like get out like, uh, like little eyeglass things and like show it, like check, check our umpire's eyes. Um, so a lot of it's up to you. And then some of it like is planned out by the bananas. Well, thank you for clarifying all of that. And for those of you guys that are interested in seeing some of any of this fun, creative content, I will go ahead and shout out Jackson's Instagram. It's simply at J underscore Olson. So that's O L S O N. And then the number two, we know where the number two comes from because obviously he's a Derek Jeter fan. And I believe he mentioned he was number two in his early years. Obviously he wears a different Jersey number now because somebody is already wearing the number two, but again, that is at J underscore Olson, the number two. I want to talk a little bit about who is Ripkin the bat dog. Is that the Savannah bananas bat boy dog or was that little dog just visiting you guys? And who the heck is Nana Gale? Because I thought those videos were hilarious. Yeah, that's a, another huge part of Banana Land is the entertainment aspect and the entertainers. Like Ripkin the Bat Dog and Nana Gale, they're both, they're both huge parts, entertainers. Ripkin was just visiting, but hopefully he'll be back. And it was so fun to be able to like, before the game, I was training Ripkin to come up to me and give me the bat and like, give me my bat. And then like, he already knows how to do all the, like rest, like go get the bat. But like, I had to kneel down and like give like a little like, come here, come on. And then like pat the ground. And then when I patted the ground, that was when he sprinted after me and like gave me my bat. Nana Gale, the Banana Nanas, it's a grandma dance team. And they always come out and do fun celebrations with us. And then they'll dance. They'll have their own thing before games, after games. And it's really like, we have a dancing first base coach, dancing umpire. We have a, a dad bod cheerleading squad. We have everything and banana splits. These young girls that are dancers, like a, a young girl dance team, uh, they come in. It's just like everything. There, there's so much to the show that you can't really see on social media and on TV. Like if you come to a game, you almost have to record everything going around you or else you'll forget everything because there's so much going on. Well, as we start to wrap up this fantastic episode featuring athlete and social media influencer Jackson Olson, he's been giving you guys so much freaking insider detail on who are the Savannah Bananas, what it's been like to currently play for them thus far. And again, they are projected, I believe, to play in about 30 plus cities, which I think is freaking amazing. I cannot wait to follow along on social media. Again, as I keep saying, I can't wait to go to a game, but baseball season for me obviously overlaps with what they are up to. So I want to discuss the upcoming 2023 Savannah Banana season. Again, as I mentioned, 30 plus cities. When does this all begin? I know you guys recently just had your media day, I believe, uh, end of January, beginning of February. And where can people get tickets? I know that it's probably already sold out. As you mentioned, there's a huge wait list. But 
when does it begin? Where does it begin? Where can people get tickets? All of that good stuff. So it begins uh, in West Palm Beach, February 17th, and goes uh, our last games in Cooperstown. And that's going to be in September, I think it is. Yeah, September. So it's an eight-month season, 33 cities, 86 shows. The way to get tickets, I mean, <laughs> it's – if you, if you haven't thought about it yet, like getting tickets, it's going to be very, very difficult unless you buy them on a third party site for who knows how much. Um, but you go to the bananas website, you get on the wait list. Like I said before, the wait list is climbing, but it's already at half a million. Um, just the wait list. Like there's also a presale list that is like before the wait list. And that's even crazier. But yeah, go to the bananas website. They'll lead you through everything, how to do it. But if you really want to go to a game, like it might be on a third party website if you haven't thought about it already. Any fun details that you are able to share this upcoming season? I know that you guys probably like to keep things a secret because you want people to be surprised and obviously entertained. But is there anything that you guys are like, okay, somebody's going to walk out with a Christmas tree on their back or they're going to have more bats on fire this season? Or maybe you guys will have your own bat dog, like Ripkin the bat dog. Is there anything you can share with us? Or does that have to stay top secret for the fans. Oh yeah. We keep that secret. Like until even when like we have a major league baseball player come or a former guy come like no, they don't announce it. It's like in the moment. Oh my gosh. That's like Jonathan Papelbon. Like, that's like, like all like guys will come and they don't say it. So yeah, we don't announce any of that stuff. But the one thing that's cool is we're playing a team of former big leaguers. So the major league players association, major league baseball players association, they're putting together a team. We're playing three games against them. Um, and then something really cool is happening at the very end of the year after our last game that is going to be all over social media, all over everywhere. It's, it's going to be crazy. And yeah, so just got to wait to see a lot of these things. Awesome. I just wanted to ask you that question to kind of get people hyped up, right? If you're listening and if you're a Bananas fan, you are probably listening to this thinking like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to follow along on social media watch the documentary and hopefully sneak into a game somehow and get a ticket. Even if it's not this season, look into it for maybe next year. Again, I don't know how far in advance I do sell these tickets, but if they're on a freaking wait list and it's now uh, before spring training, then obviously they're very popular and I would assume they're going to continue to expand. With that being said, I know you just kind of mentioned sometimes there's some former big leaguers. Do you guys ever like invite retired big leaguers to come to like a game or two how does that work are they able to come join you guys or like playfully coach once in a while yeah sometimes it'll be jesse reaching out our owner reaching out or like a player a lot of players are reaching out now to play and even we even the players don't know some of the guys that are going to be playing this year but yeah it's usually half and half like jesse will reach out or one of the guys will be like hey like johnny gomes was in a certain city hey i'll be here um, can I play with you guys? Definitely come play. That is awesome. And I know we're going to start to wrap up this episode because you have a busy day set aside. And I want to personally start to thank you for coming on here. And I know my listeners are going to fully enjoy tuning in. You guys are now listening to Jackson Olson. I'm your host, Brittany Baldi of the Boss Babe Lifestyle Sports Podcast. Thank you guys for listening. This has been one of the most entertaining episodes of 2023 thus far. And as I mentioned, you guys know that my podcast is like a audible reality tv show especially with my reality tv background i like to have my guests not just on here once we'll probably hopefully get jackson back on here again in the off season to kind of recap how his first full season was but with that being said jackson as we start to wrap up this episode what are you most excited for for 2023 and any last words regarding the savannah bananas i'm just excited that we get to impact half a million fans in person this year and the fact that, like, I have only seen, I mean, I played six games, so six times, I, like 24,000 fans, and a lot of them were the same people in the Summer Series. Now it's 500,000 people that we get to impact and make, like, remember this, remember that game for the rest of their lives, maybe. Like, who knows? Like, some people might be like, yeah, I remember the time I went to the Bananas game, like 20 years from now. It's really special that we're going to be able to do this this year. In positive pop, I do something on here. Again, my show is very positive, or I'd like to at least think it is. So when I created this podcast, 
two, three years ago with one of my best friends. We like to wrap up every episode with something we like to call positive pop. And Jackson, that can be any type of positive mantra. I don't know if there's like a book that you read first thing in the morning, maybe a song that you listen to if you're feeling down. Maybe you go ahead and you talk to your mom and dad for some words of inspiration. Wrap up the show with what is your positive pop? And please shout out your social media again. Yeah. So I guess that would be what I, I said this, I said this quote before about the greatest showman, but it's no one ever made a difference by being like everyone else. And that's what I go by every single day. And if you go by that, your life will change. Like if you seriously actually go by that, your life will undoubtedly change. If you just say, oh yeah, I'm going to be myself for three days of the week or four days or six days and 23 hours. No, it has to be seven days. It has to be every second of every day. You're going to be different. You're going to be unique. What's your unique mindset? It, like I said, it'll change your life and bring you somewhere you literally never thought you would be able to go to. That is fantastic. And your social media one last time is simply at J underscore Olson, the number two. I just want to wish you luck personally. I'm sure my listeners are sending you the good vibes spiritually and through their own vibes as they listen. But best of luck this season. I cannot wait to follow along through social media and recap at the end of the season. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope you enjoy the full summer. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on.